going to introduce the next panel. Now we're going to hear from the geographers and the historical geographers, the historical urban geographers. Um, and so um, this, this uh, panel um, is, has a little bit different perspective. Uh, we're gonna be hearing from, well, we have three papers, but one of the papers has two, um, two authors. And um, so we're uh, first gonna hear from um, Luke Anselin and Sarah Williams. And Luke Anselin, God, it's weird, introducing my husband, okay. Um, He's a Regents Professor and Walter Izar Chair at um, Arizona State University, and he is a spatial statistician, I think you would say, um, most about him. I think his um, claim to fame is, um, among other things, uh, Geoda uh, software. He is, he's Mr. Geoda, basically. And, um, he is working um, in conjunction with Sarah Williams, who's an assistant professor at MIT in the um, Department of Urban Studies and Planning. And um, she is an amazing um, visualizer of all things geographic and um, a specialist in GIS and um, was at Columbia University for many years. Uh, where, she, oh, she's also director of the Civic Data Design Lab at MIT. Thank you very much, it's, it's just me, uh, otherwise it's too complicated, so whenever there are any tough questions, Sarah will answer them. Um, this um, presentation is actually very much work in progress, and it came out of a class that we co-taught last fall at MIT on uh, big data and urban analytics. And it's a, big, a bit of a change from what we saw this morning, as you'll see, in that is taking um, a, a data-driven approach to looking at neighborhoods. A part of this work is funded by NSF and a number of people helped us getting data and manipulating some of the data. <clears throat> so what I'd like to do in my 20 minutes allotted is uh, very quickly uh, some neighborhood concepts. I think several people talked about this at length already. Uh, a little bit of background on big data and social media computing, in case you're not familiar with it. Um, probably not too much about the technical clustering approaches that we're using. And then a, an initial set of results of an illustration of the analysis of what we call digital neighborhoods in New York City. And, and then I will close. So what is a neighborhood? We've heard a lot about that already. Um, there's a huge literature in different fields. What we are going to be doing is taking uh, what I call an operational approach. And so basically we're looking at the definition of neighborhoods as a, an exercise in clustering where we have, we start with small entities and we put them together in ways so that they internally are as similar as possible and between them as dissimilar as possible. So technically, mathematically, it's really an optimization problem and at that it's a multi-criteria optimization problem because what are the measures that one use to define similarity and dissimilarity? So most of the presentations we saw this morning looked at neighborhood as what I call a container in the sense that you use existing delineations. Uh, as we heard uh, yesterday evening, the, a neighborhood doesn't really exist. Um, but we do have these administrative units that have nice crisp boundaries and we can count what's in the boundaries and then use that to group the little units together into maybe some things that are somewhat more meaningful. Uh, that's one approach. Another approach is to actually use social media, which themselves define neighborhoods in that when you click on something, it will tell you where you are and what neighborhood you're in. Now, these two tend to be very connected. And then um, we depart from this approach and take, as I said, an operational statistical approach where there's really two ways of looking at it. One is taking all the little atomic units and putting them together in groups, and we then call these groups neighborhoods, uh, whether that's appropriate or not. Or we do a statistical analysis to find places within the city or within a metropolitan area that, uh, following some statistical measure, are more similar to each other than others. And so those kind of neighborhoods don't necessarily exhaust 
the whole city, but they point to certain foci of interest or certain areas that are more similar than you would expect um, randomly. And then there's this totally different approach, which goes um, back to maybe the neighborhood, uh, the idea of a neighborhood perception, where you actually ask people what they think their neighborhood is, and we heard a little bit about that. This is done quite a bit with children, where you ask them to draw where they, their neighborhood is and how far it goes. And so essentially, essentially you build this up from points or observations, individual observations, and then find some kind of way to say, okay, this is a common overlap uh, among the opinion of all these kids, so this is the neighborhood. Or you have a, a slightly different technique, which is the one we'll be showing, where you have individual points and somehow you draw a line around these points. And then you can see to what extent these dynamically generated neighborhoods match the crisp administrative lines and or some concepts of neighborhoods that we have. So let me spend a few minutes on big data and social media computing. Um, it's uh, among certain circles quite the rage, um, the, not among everybody. The uh, big data is really one can think of as a new paradigm in computational social science. Um, uh, the folks at uh, Microsoft and Google have been pushing this idea considerably as a fourth paradigm uh, in scientific research. It's very much data-driven. Um, a couple of things that are, are different in the statistical approach, the most important of which is that the number of observations is everything. So there is no sample, you have the population. You have all the tweets that happened in a particular time, every single one of them, okay? And that changes how you think about this. This also gives you some new opportunities and the types of analyses one can carry out. Where does this big data come from? The way I tend to look at it is three major moves that facilitated this. One is the movement towards smart cities, the I neighborhood of Doug Farr, uh, with ubiquitous sensors everywhere. Uh, city of Chicago is going to put in 500 or so sensors and traffic lights that will measure continuously a whole bunch of different environmental metrics. A second very important movement is the open data movement. And here again, Chicago is a prime example where a whole host of administrative data are made available uh, for analysis, uh, all of it. And then thirdly, the part that we will be concerned with today is the social media data, um, all kinds of new sources of information, um, I should say warts and all. So the two that we will focus on uh, today in this particular talk are Twitter and Foursquare. Uh, if you don't know, a tweet is 140 characters. It's a very short, posting, but it's not just the message that matters. Of course, to the people who tweet, it's the message, but there's all kinds of very interesting metadata, data about data in there, such as the latitude and the longitude of the position where the tweet was made. Um, Foursquare is specifically geared to commercial ventures. It's um, you can check in to a particular venue. Now that can be, typically that's a store or something or a railroad station, but it can also be your bathroom or your TV room. And then you, if you do it enough, you can become mayor of that place. And there's a whole <laughs> microculture around it. What we're interested in is that these social media have the geography, I call it the micro geography in it because it's at the point level. So you have, the Latin long, this is totally voluntary. And as it turns out, between two and a half and five percent of all the tweets actually have this Latin long. And so, of course, as a social scientist, right away you start thinking bias. I mean, who in their right mind lets the world know where they are when they tweet, right? Well, about five percent of the people who tweet. Um, Foursquare is different because it is about locations. So the locations is an inherent part of, of the message. And so when we look at this data, you always have to think, well, who does this? And this is by no means representative of the whole population. But it is representative of the population that tweets. And so we can learn something about 
um, what patterns these tweets show, how does it match or map to socioeconomic characteristics, uh, how does it map to the actual geography. So what we like um, to call these are digital neighborhoods. And so we're interested in finding out how much information these digital neighborhoods can give us because, as we'll see shortly, there are places where there is a lot of tweeting going on and there are places where there's very little going on. And social media computing then is a whole new, you could call it an industry or a whole new field of um, the emerging data science which has come um, a mixture of statistics, computer science, and data manipulation, getting your hands dirty. Uh, the one characteristic of this um, computing is these data sets are massive. And uh, for example, in, in a single day, uh, we have 117,000 geocoded tweets. Um, and that is just the 3, 4% of the total. Uh, you have an open API, that means an application programming interface, which means if you know how to program, you can get the data with some caveats, but basically you can get everything. And the perspective that one takes in this analysis is maybe a little unusual or uncomfortable to traditionalists. More is better. More information is always better than less information. It's very messy. It's not necessarily that precise. There'll be redundancy and, and errors in it. And we move away from causation. We, one moves away from causation and focuses on correlation, which of course um, is a very different way of looking at the world. Uh, very different, say, from George's structural model, which clearly has the arrows of what points to what. Here there are no arrows. There's just a whole bunch of data, and let's see what comes out. And of course, how do we see that? We see that by using the appropriate methods, which are in part traditional statistics, but mostly machine learning, data mining. Uh, when I was trained, data mining was a bad word, so now it's a good word. I'm going to speed up because at this rate I'll never finish. So um, what we're interested in is the metadata. We have the location stamp. We have the time and date stamp. So we know when this happened and where this happened. And um, we'll look at this idea of uh, digital neighborhoods. So it's the city through the eyes of the citizen. It's a form of crowdsourcing where people voluntarily provide the information. There's no sampling or anything like that going on. And we're interested in, in the dynamics of this. Uh, where does it happen? When does it happen? How does it map to socioeconomic strata? How does it map to the actual geography? So I've got the five minutes sign, so so much for my um, timing here. I'm going to skip the technical part. If you're interested, I can always elaborate. This was what prompted uh, us to look into this. This is a project called Livehoods. It's at Carnegie Mellon uh, by uh, some computer scientists who used Foursquare check-ins to delineate neighborhoods. And there are a number of issues with this which got us into this, but what I uh, want to do is just spend a few minutes, because that's all I have, showing some uh, pictures for uh, New York City. And we took the data in the first week of February 2014. So this is another thing about social media data. When did you ever see a paper that used data from a month ago? Um, we had the data from GNIP and Foursquare itself, and we aggregated it up to the block group. Um, this was a lot of work. Let me just uh, summarize it as such. Uh, this gives you an idea of what we have. So we have a total of roughly 580,000 um, messages, uh, roughly equal between the two. Um, but the number of venues are not the same. So Twitter is wherever you are, you click. Foursquare tends to be focused on businesses and is a much smaller universe. When we aggregate this to the block group, you see an incredibly skewed distribution. First of all, many block groups, two, three hundred, have nothing at all, zero. Then a few block groups are very, very high. For example, the, the highest in Foursquare has 12,000 um, check-ins in, during that week. 
And it's a very skewed distribution, which you can see by the difference between the mean and the median. So these few very high check-in places pull the distribution, pull the mean up, whereas the median is much more uh, balanced. I have to show you this, because Sarah worked very hard on getting this. This is the animation of the tweets uh, on a 24-hour basis. And so this shows you, this is New York. It shows you that all the action is in Manhattan, but also in a few other places. It also shows you that there are lots of places with very little to no action at all. If you look very carefully, which we don't have time to get into now, you can see some changes in the patterning during the time of the day. But basically, this is the raw material that we work with. So these are all the, the observations. Um, a couple of descriptive statistics. Um, this is important to see. This is the distribution of businesses. And the Twitter venues are a little more distributed throughout the landscape, but the Foursquare venues are not. And so one of the problems with looking at this data is that you have the totals, but the totals as such don't tell you that much about the distribution. So what we did was compute what is called the location quotient. And this roughly gives you an idea of how a block group is relative to the rest of the city in, uh, in terms of its population. So are the number of tweets that you have as a proportion of all the tweets in the city, how do they compare to the population you have rough relative to the population in the city? So if this coefficient is much larger than one, then you're tweeting much more than your population share would allow you, and we call these digital hotspots. And the other way around, we call them digital deserts, because you tweet much less than your population share would allow you to do. Now, the problem, as anybody knows who's worked with this kind of data, is that you have a lot of block groups that have no people in them. So anytime you divide by zero, computers don't like this. And so you have to deal with this. You have to think about it. And, and we did. I don't have time to get into it. But this gives you a, a, a sense of the location quotient for Twitter. So what you see right off the bat is um, a concentration in Manhattan, but also in some of the hip new areas like Long Island City and um, Brooklyn, uh, you see a lot of blue. Now if you look at, um, but also the, the middle part, the green and the yellow are not interesting, they're not extreme. So this is what I call an outlier map where you pull the attention to the extremes. And then if we do this for Foursquare, you see a much higher degree of concentration because this is really, as we found out, all about businesses. And it's about a particular kind of people. And I, I just want to show you a nice speech. <laughs> this is where this comes from, all right? Caught in the act, so to speak. Well, not really, but. So then, uh, just to close, a little more technical analysis is a local autocorrelation coefficient. I won't. Um, I can't say bore because I came up with it, but it's very exciting, but I won't get into technical <laughs> details. Basically, what you should look at is the reds. Those are block groups that are, have high location quotients surrounded by other block groups that also have high location quotients. So this is a grouping across space, which starts to get us towards this notion of a neighborhood. The blues are the opposite are cold spots, so to speak. And then the funny colors are spatial outliers, where a neighborhood has high location quotient, but it's surrounded by very low location quotients. And so what you actually do in a real analysis is you start, try, start overlaying this with a real map, looking at other socioeconomic characteristics, and, and so on. So um, here again, we find the same um, foci of high concentration. Let me close because I'm over time. What did we find? This is very beginning. Um, I won't tell you how, how close we are. Uh, I mean, how close to the deadline we actually came up with these results. The um, one issue is this is New York City, Manhattan dominates everything. And so an obvious uh, question is how does this scale to other cities? Uh, how generalizable is that? We do see very clear patterns of hot spots and deserts, what I call them. There's some match with traditional neighborhoods as they are perceived, but not uh, perfect. 
And there's some interesting day-night dynamics that we didn't have time to get into. As I said, this beginning, very initial, we'll uh, do a little technical work, but we'll also, we're very interested in this notion of what does this correlate with in, in terms of socioeconomics, and also this notion of uh, how do the social networks, because Tweed are really a one-directional social network, one follows somebody else, uh, how do these um, map in, into space? And of course, we'll need to look at something uh, beyond uh, New York City. But one interesting thing that we didn't have time to show, in he to show here is that our initial uh, suspicion was that this had a lot to do with income. And as it turns out, at least at the level of the block, block group, it does not. So it's probably more something like age or so maybe occupation, but it's not income. So that's very interesting, and I think uh, there's a lot left to do. And in my 20 minutes, this is about all I can say. Thank you. <laughs>